This presentation argues for the importance of nurturing teachers and professors in a well-grounded conception of authentic intellectual work as a basis for instructional designs. High levels of authentic pedagogy are necessary for achieving a democratic goal of civil competence. The research discussed today reveals that too little such work is going on in high schools. What about here at Hofstra? The presentation provides the Hofstra community with the tools to assess their own instruction. Before, I, I know many of you know Andrea uh, already, uh, but I think, uh, and she's a dear colleague, uh, to be too, and I really value her research and her teaching. But I think it uh, it befits uh, to give uh, some kind of a description of a bio, which is uh, incredible. And this is also a short version, so you can imagine how much is done over the years. Uh, Dr. Andrea Libresco is professor in the Department of Teaching, Learning, and Technology at Hofstra, where she teaches prospective and current teachers at the graduate and undergraduate levels how to teach social studies and co-directs the Childhood and Early Childhood program. She also teaches at the doctoral level, has taught in the Honors College, and directs the minors in civic engagement and peace and conflict studies. She was named Distinguished Teacher of the Year in 2005 and was Director of Pedagogy for the Center for Teaching and Scholarly Excellence, which she, uh, which she hopes will be revived. She, is just, uh, she was just named the Leo Ergerthar Distinguished Professor in Teaching Excellence. Because she believes in, as John Dewey did, uh, did that, I quote, a democracy is more than a form of government. It is primarily a mode of associated living of conjoint communicated experience, unquote. Andrea serves on the advisory boards of the Center for Civic Engagement and the Institute for Peace Studies and co-directed the Peace Fellow Program. Her most recent chapters chronicles the emergence of this peace community at Hofstra and appears in a volume published in conjunction with the 50th anniversary of Kent State. Four Dead in Ohio, the global legacy of youth activism and state repression. She directs the Hofstra network of elementary teachers and her favorite two HNET programs were The Book That Shaped My Life and The Teacher Who Shaped My Life. Prior to her work at Hofstra, Andrea was a high school social studies department chair and teacher, as well as a lead teacher for elementary social studies in the public schools. She was named secondary teacher of the year uh, by the Long Island Council for Social Studies in 1997. She has written on a variety of topics, including standardized testing, exemplary social studies teachers, children's literature, civic engagement, peace pedagogy, and women's history. Her books include, every book is a social studies book, how to meet standards with picture books. K-6 exemplary elementary social studies, case studies in practice. Notable books, notable lessons, putting social studies back in the K-8 curriculum and peace lessons from around the world. And she was co-editor of the National Journal Social Studies and the Young Learners for five years she is proud that three of those four books and the journal were co-authored or co-edited with a former Hofstra student. In accordance with her commitment to civic engagement, she's past president of the Nassau chapter of the New York Civil Liberties Union and president of the Long Island Alliance for Peaceful Alternatives. She received the Long Islander uh, she received the Long Islander who has made a difference award from the Long Island Progressive Coalition in 2012 and tries to live Harry Chapin's maxim to, to know is to care, to care is to act, to act is to make a difference, unquote. She received her BA in history and political science from Sw Swarthmore College, her Master of Arts in teaching from Brown University and her doctorate in education from Columbia University. I, as I said, have known Andrea for many years and truly value her as a colleague, but also her incredible approach to pedagogy and practice. So it is my pleasure now to invite Dr. Andrea Libresco to give the 56th Distinguished Lecture. Welcome. 
Wow, thank you, Maggie. Wow. <laughs> um, I, I just want to say that I concur with Herman, uh, who says that the distinguished lectures are really fun to attend. Um, I've attended not as many as Herman by any means, but but I've attended quite a few uh, and really enjoyed them. So I'm I'm really delighted to be a part of it. Okay, so I guess I should share my screen at this point, <laughs> as as one does. Um, <laughs> So let's do that. Here we go. <laughs> Everybody can see something, correct? <laughs> like the title slide, yay. <laughs> okay, one, one scary thing down. So uh, to begin, I wanna say good afternoon to everyone. And uh, if this is possible and not too much trouble, if is everybody in control of their own mutes right now? Because I wanted everybody to unmute for one second and say good afternoon back. So I know you're out there. Um, and good then you can re mute. Good, good afternoon. Good afternoon. Hey, Andrea. <laughs> Excellent. Excellent. Thank you. So, so my talk today, as you can see, is about authentic intellectual work, and I'll call it AIW throughout. And I promise uh, we'll define it and identify it and even do a little work of our own. Uh, but first, I want to tell you how I came to care about it. Along the way, I'm hopeful that it will become fairly apparent what it is. I I'm going to start with a trip in the way back machine uh, to my junior high school social studies class with Toby Watson. Uh, for all you folks in the audience of a certain age, yes, that was a reference to Sherman and Mr. Peabody's method of time travel. Um, let's see now. Now, why didn't it? Oh, one second. I'm not sure why it didn't uh, go to the next slide. Let's just see. Oh, there we go. I just didn't hit it hard enough. Okay. <laughs> all right, much better. There's Sherman and Mr. Peabody. Uh, so I went to junior high and high school in the 1970s. And except for my advanced placement history and English courses, every other course I took in social studies and English was an elective. Each elective in junior high lasted for a quarter. Uh, the, in seventh grade, I selected an anthropology elective where my class created a civilization. We made artifacts, we buried them in the back of the school, truly. Uh, and then Mr. Marshall's class next door had done the same thing. So we deliberated for days on what time period and level of sophistication our civilization should encompass. Ours was an early one. So I, who was responsible for doing communication, made a drum. And the need to create period appropriate artifacts stimulated our need to read about past civilizations as well as the writings of futurists in case we were considering uh, making a civilization from centuries ahead. Mr. Watson, our teacher, had all of these materials on hand, some of which we discuss as an entire class, others we'd examine in small groups as the need arose. I have no memory of feeling rushed. In fact, I think there was occasionally some lag time while we waited for everyone in the class to be ready to bury their items. When it came time to dig up the class next door civilization and for them to excavate ours, just as anthropologists do, Mr. Watson and Mr. Marshall were on hand with materials on how real anthropologists photograph, brush, and label the artifacts they find in various layers. Thus, we would have an opportunity to simulate the painstaking detective work of real anthropologists as we tried to figure out each other's civilizations, then write our anthropological reports, hypothesizing about the nature of the civilizations we had unearthed. The two and a half months we spent acting as anthropologists finding out the characteristics of civilizations and of anthropologists and archeologists were a model of depth over breadth in curriculum and instruction. Clearly this unit began with an assumption that big ideas, themes and concepts must be the starting point for good instruction. So there's Mr. Watson. <laughs> Let's travel a few years ahead to my 12th grade English class with Ms. Higgins. V. Louise Higgins, my 12th grade English teacher wrote one to two pages of single spaced comments on our papers. I'll say that again, one to two pages of single spaced comments on our papers. Her personalized journal assignments were designed to make each of us wide awake in the world. Every two weeks, each student was charged with writing a response to an article that Ms. Higgins had picked out particularly for him or her. It was not until I became a teacher that I truly appreciated the volume of individualized preparation and grading that these assignments entailed, not to mention the assumption that members of our class were individuals with different interests and needs. My first assignment was a my turn piece for Newsweek. Uh, an immigrant had written in about immigration policy. I was tasked with writing a letter to the editor in response. I felt pretty good. 
until it was returned with that full page of single space comments. Ms. Higgins wondered why my letter had been so impersonal, why I had not, amid my policy analyses, extended a welcome to this recent immigrant to America. Her comment reminded me that analytical thought is but one aspect of being a citizen in a democracy. Another is recognizing and valuing the individual experiences of the variety of citizens who make up our multicultural democracy and greeting them with the humanity that they all deserve. And all of these years later, I remember these assignments for learning with understanding is more likely to promote transfer of learning than simply memorizing information from a text or a lecture. And there's uh, V. Louise Higgins, and there's the quote I just gave from the National Research Council. My 1970s social studies experiences exemplify what some researchers term effective teaching, others call ambitious or powerful teaching or wide practice. Whatever the nomenclature, teachers are trying to scaffold and respond to students' learning efforts by creating tasks that call for problem solving or critical thinking, not just memory or reproduction. In addition, teachers work to teach subject matter knowledge within contexts that call for students to relate their learning to their lives by think, thinking critically or creatively about it or by using it to solve problems or make decisions. In all of these tasks, students are the ones with the substantial intellectual responsibility. All of these are descriptors of Mr. Watson and Ms. Higgins classes, neither of which had standardized either by the school or the state final exams. I actually cannot recall if they had final exams at all. I only remember the projects and as it turns out, a lot of authentic intellectual work. Fast forward to the 1980s as I moved from student to teacher. I started teaching high school social studies in 1982. I hadn't set foot on Long Island before. I didn't grow up in New York State. I hadn't heard of the regions. And so I taught how I taught without regard for a state exam. My students did a lot of work in groups, even before the advent of Zoom breakout rooms, including working for a whole week on the question of whether or not the US should have dropped the bombs on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. I had them read a variety of articles, not mere excerpts, from historians who supported the decision, saying it saved a million lives that would have been lost in the invasion of Japan, as well as historians who said, no, the bombs were used not to subdue our then enemy, but to warn our ally of convenience, the Soviet Union, not to invade Japan and pick up some post-war bounty. That year, there was no question on the region's multiple choice about the dropping of the bombs, nor was there an essay on that content, though, my, though the skills my students learned on that project would stand them in good stead on their essays on other topics. And my students did at least as well on the region's as those of my department colleagues, not that it's a contest, <clears throat> It was 20 years later when I was at Hofstra teaching future teachers how to teach that George W. Bush brought his Texas testing regimen to Washington, enabled by no less a liberal lion than Ted Kennedy with no child left behind and Barack Obama's race to the top, putting the testing program on steroids and, and tying student scores to teacher performance reviews. Here on Long Island, testing was taken seriously uh, test scores would appear in the newspaper and housing prices would be tied to district test scores. When I went to professional conferences, I would hear elementary social studies methods professors complain that given the emphasis on the subjects that were tested, literacy and math, no, no time for social studies was left. It was shrinking. And they were certainly correct. Multiple studies confirm this. Nevertheless, after a while, Many of us got tired of this refrain and we compiled a book of case studies of elementary teachers at different levels who were still engaging in wise practice, even in the face of standardized testing. Unlike the other chapters of the book, uh, the other authors of the chapters, I was observing elementary teachers whose students were subject to a statewide social studies test, which by the way was eliminated by the New York Board of Regents a decade ago. I found that students of the exemplary teachers I'd observed had not been kept from engaging in thoughtful intellectual work by the tests. On the contrary, students' test essays had voice and even created their own theses, though the essay question hadn't even really asked them to do so. I'll share an excerpt. This essay was a document-based question on how the Iroquois used nature to get their wants and needs. In effect, that was the thesis uh, that was to be supported by the documents supplied on the test. But students of these exemplary teachers 
did not write the formulaic essays that other teacher students did. And you can sort of hear what those formulaic essays sound like, right? Uh, the Iroquois used nature to get their wants and needs. One way they used nature was cutting wood from trees to make canoes. A second way was, you know what those sound like. Okay, now listen to this. Chop, chop, the sound of Iroquois tribe building longhouses. They use trees to cover the home with warmth. Twigs and rope from animal skin hold the structure. Many families lived in longhouses. I caught one, the sound of fishing. The hook is made from shell. So is spoons to eat with, war clubs and scrapers. My legs hurt, tired of hurting your feet? The Iroquois use boats from trees to travel. They make boats from trees and sleds. Did they have cars? No. Trains? No. Not even bikes? No. Where's my jeans and sweatshirt? The Iroquois made clothes from animal skin. No jeans, shirts, t-shirts, socks, or sneakers, just animal skin. Now, now here comes the implicit thesis. So as you can see, we don't need high tech stuff. All we need is trees and animals. And, and here's what I think of as the filler. No ice cream? No. No radio? No. No jeans, shirts, so, so, shoes, and socks? No, no, no. I think the Iroquois are natural people. Uh, another student uh, from that test had also, and from those teachers, had also marveled at the ability of the Iroquois to use nature instead of all the modern conveniences we have. Here's his conclusion. It's amazing how they got so many products they couldn't live without, plus some extra to get their wants. But the biggest thing is that they got supplies from things in the forest. That's the Iroquois for you. You gotta love them. <laughs> The next year at the conference, I went to the secondary social studies method sessions and colleagues were complaining that the Plato to NATO, breadth over depth, specificity of the multiple choice testing and the publicizing of the passing and mastery scores, which are above 85%, were hampering teachers' ability to do engaging and thoughtful work. Just as had occurred at the elementary sessions, some of us wanted to do something about it. At the secondary level, we wanted to show that students whose teachers were doing engaging and thoughtful work could still pass the statewide tests, doing at least as well as students whose teachers engaged in lower level test prep. But we had to figure out how to find a consistent measure of engaging and thoughtful work. And now we come to the term coined by Fred Newman, AIW, authentic intellectual work, to describe the attributes necessary for rigorous learning. Uh, of course, we've been talking about it all along. <laughs> Newman and his colleagues used the complex intellectual challenges faced by adults in their public and personal lives as guidelines to develop a set of research-based standards for high quality student, teach, student learning. These standards measure the degree of authentic intellectual work that occurs in a classroom. The AIW standards assess the degree to which teaching and learning go beyond reproduction of prior knowledge to construct new understandings about meaningful problems. Engage students in disciplined inquiry that uses prior knowledge and rules of evidence to ensure that newly constructed knowledge has depth, rigor, and value. Require complex communication of student understandings through extended descriptions, explanations, justifications, and dialogue. And feature work that has value beyond school, student products that have an impact on others in ways that go beyond demonstration of factual recall. Why does this kind of work matter? The research indicates that Discipline inquiry is the best means for developing complex understanding and problem solving. Small localized samples suggest that discipline inquiry is rare in social studies. No large scale studies have been done in social studies for 20 years when we did this. And we also know that students of color are the least likely to receive inquiry based instruction. In addition, the dominant pattern of instruction observed in social studies classrooms emphasizes superficial coverage of large bodies of content. Such instruction is inadequate for developing the intellectual capital necessary for democratic citizenship. To develop civic competency, teachers must engage students in challenging inquiry that cultivates the knowledge and skills necessary for addressing the complex problems posed by democratic life. And if you don't believe me, check out this I iconic Tea Party protest sign. <laughs> funny, not funny, <clears throat> but really, <laughs> This is not only relevant for social studies. Consistent evidence across a wide range of studies supports discipline inquiry as the best means for developing complex understanding, problem solving, and decision making in social studies, science, and mathematics. In the study we're focusing on today, 
33 other researchers and I collaborated in a three-year project to assess the degree of authentic intellectual challenge present in a diverse group of social studies classrooms in six states and examined how the level of authentic pedagogy related to student performance on state mandated content knowledge tests. Specifically, we asked, to what extent do teachers in the schools studied offer authentic pedagogy in instruction and assessment and how much variation exists between teachers and the experiences offered to students? To what extent are students from different social and academic backgrounds likely to encounter authentic pedagogy? And what is the relationship between authentic pedagogy and student performance on state mandated tests of content knowledge? We selected six, we selected sites in six states with state mandated social studies tests, as you can see, Alabama, Georgia, New York, Ohio, Texas, and Virginia. We used a purposeful critical case sampling strategy to select teachers who taught history courses with content that was assessed by mandated tests and who'd been identified by administrators, teaching peers and project researchers as practicing at least some of the standards for high quality student learning reflected in authentic pedagogy construct. Although we selected the initial teacher in each school based on the likelihood that that teacher might demonstrate AIW, we held no such expectations for the broader teacher sample. Once we'd recruited the ones identified as authentic pedagogy oriented teachers, we invited all of their peers who taught social studies in the same school at the same grade level to participate in the study. We had no prior information about their teaching practices and 83% of the eligible teachers on those grade levels chose to participate. The thing about a critical case sampling strategy is it makes sense when a phenomenon is known to be rare, as past researchers suggested that this was true of authentic pedagogy. And, and it, it's really typified by, if you think about the statement, if it doesn't happen there, it won't happen anywhere. That, that it's, you know, we're setting it up so that we'll see some. Our sampling strategy provided promising settings for encountering authentic pedagogy and practice, we felt. In addition, we deliberately sampled for best case examples of intellectually challenging instruction for all participating teachers by asking the teachers to select lessons they believed to be their most challenging lessons. There were two stages to the study. Stage one focused on an assessment of authentic pedagogy in social studies classrooms. We collected data from classroom observations, assigned assessment tasks, teacher interviews, and archived student records. We conducted a 30 to 60 minute uh, teacher interviews prior to beginning classroom observations. Um, in preparation for the interview sessions, teachers selected the three most challenging student assessment tasks for their courses uh, as defined um, by the tasks they believed to be the best indicators of how well students understood their subject at, high, at a high level. Interviewers then clarified the classroom context of each assessment task to help them determine the most uh, appropriate class sessions to observe to gain insight. And then by asking teachers for their most challenging assessment tasks, we sought to capture the maximum degree to which each teacher engaged students with AIW. In stage two, uh, their performance on state mandated measures of content knowledge for students who studied under high scoring AIW teachers was compared to those of student peers in lower scoring AIW classrooms to discover what relationships might exist between authentic pedagogy and student performance. All tests feature multiple choice questions as the dominant or exclusive testing format. And an analysis using Bloom's taxonomy found that all tests emphasize lower level cognitive skills, recall and comprehension. I know you're shocked, shocked. Uh, with only 15% of the items across the entire sample requiring some level of higher order thinking. The percentage of higher order items varied widely among the states. Uh, Virginia averaged just 5% higher order thinking items on its tests and only Alabama uh, featured more than 15% of higher order thinking items with a whopping 23%. The demographics of the sample can be seen in the next two slides. So you can see the schools of what they spent on their pupils, who the, uh, what percentage of non-white students, et cetera. Um, no surprise in many ways, the social studies profession is still more male and wildly white. Um, and you can see the ages and the teachers averaged 11 years. Um, more of the classes were US history classes. 73% uh, were, were so-called regular education classes, um, a, a term that is problematic, but the one that was used in the study. 
Um, and you can see the students predominantly white uh, from where these teachers were situated, um, these college professors <laughs> seeing the teachers. Okay, <clears throat> so um, each researcher used a common set of uh, AIW measures to assess classroom teaching. Uh, Newman and his colleagues created three scales for assessing AIW instruction, assessment tasks, and student work. Our study employed only the first two, you can see. Um, and when we use the term AIW scores, we refer to the teacher scores in instruction and assessment. The AIW rubric for classroom instruction rated the degree of authenticity in classrooms across four dimensions. You can see them higher order thinking, deep knowledge, substantive conversation, and connectedness to the real world. And then the assessment tasks you can see are constructive of knowledge, elaborated communication, connection to students' lives. And, and you'll see when we look more closely at the rubrics, it's very difficult to get a high score on them. And I'm going to show you um, what they looked like in a moment. Um, but first, I also want to show you that the instructions made it very hard to get a high score. If you, if you, it, it, we were told if you find yourself between scores, you know, make the decision um, to, to give the go with the minimum standards and go with that level of the rubric. Um, and consider only the evidence observed. Many refers to a third of the students in the class. Most refers to more than half. Almost all is all but a few. Uh, so it, it wasn't easy to hit these levels. So what did they look like? Um, I, I'm, I'm not going to spend a wildly long time showing you these because you are going to do some authentic intellectual work shortly and you'll get your own sheet. Um, but um, but I, I think what you can see when it says things like almost all the students, higher order thinking, like nobody's going to get a five, right? Uh, almost all, that was all but a few. <laughs> so it, it's hard and it gives you then some tips for doing it. So everybody had these sheets on them all the time when they were doing them. Uh, and, and it's difficult, um, you know, ambiguity in, in what you're thinking about. Um, deep knowledge, a significant topic, problematic nature of information. These are hard. It's hard to score high. Substantive character of ideas. Substantive conversation. Almost all students participate in substantive conversation. What does that mean? Substantive. Um, an interchange as a statement between one person and somebody else could be teacher and student, could be student and student, but but they should respond to what the other person said. <laughs> Some adults should do this. <clears throat> Connectedness to the real world. That, that one's fairly obvious, but it doesn't happen that often. <laughs> and then this was the, the tasks rubrics construction of knowledge, elaborated communication, connection to students' lives that you can see. Analyze information, synthesize information, not merely reproduce information, draw conclusions, et cetera. And again, some ways to understand it. Okay. <laughs> um, so, so here's what happened next. <laughs> so two researchers, independently rated at least 25% of all the observations and tasks at each research site in order to provide estimates of inter-rater agreement um, and you know, establish the credibility of the primary researchers' ratings. We correlated those uh, with um, each A AIW component of the observations and the task ratings. And it turns out we had very high inter-rater inter agreement. So after that, we just did the primary researcher data. We didn't have to keep looking at the secondary. They were the same. Um, for the Stage one data, we, we calculated, and here it is, the composite scores of AIW for instruction and assessment combined. So the lowest you could get is 70, the highest is 30 for each teacher based on those four instruction components and three assessment tasks. And um, composite scores were computed for teachers who had at least two complete sets of data, uh, two observations and two tasks. And that was a total of 52 teachers who had at least two complete sets of data. 46 had three complete sets of data. Again, we did a little check and examination of the 46 teachers with three complete sets of data showed no difference. So we used the 52 with two, two complete sets. 
In order to address our first research question, we created quartiles based on the minimum and maximum number of points possible on the combined AIW scales, seven to 30, and assigned each teacher to the appropriate quartile based upon that teacher's AIW score. So here's what they were. You can see the minimal level, the limited level, the moderate level, and the substantial level. We also examined the seven individual standards for instruction and tasks within each quartile to discover if certain ones had a greater impact on the aggregate score than others. And before we look at how the teachers in our study fell among the quartiles, I will leave you hanging because it's time for a little AIW ourselves. Um, so <laughs> here we go. I'm gonna put two links in the chat and you can see where they are right there. And what, you'll, what you're gonna do is be able to access them in your breakout rooms. And I, I just wanna give a shout out to all the people who are making this, this possible and, and apologize publicly to them. I didn't spring the breakout rooms on them until just now, uh, until, until when we started. I, I thought since we use them all the time in our classes, it was an easy thing to engineer, but apparently it isn't, but they have made it possible for us to do breakout rooms. Um, so the first is the AIW rubrics um, and they, they're they small but clear. Um, and the second is a one page summary of a lesson on the Cold War. And in your breakout rooms, you're gonna examine this classroom example and the teacher's name is Wes. Well, it's his phony name is Wes. And you're gonna rate it using the AIW rubrics. You're only gonna use the first four rubrics, the one where you observe the class. You're not gonna use the task ones. And obviously you're doing a very cursory rating and you don't have a transcript, you just have an outline. Um, so it, it's brief, you know, you're gonna be in the breakout rooms for like eight minutes, <laughs> that's it. Um, so uh, I think maybe it's time for us to head to the breakout rooms. I'll stop the share for a moment. So I, I will, because I was in a breakout room, um, I will say that, you know, we did it quickly um, and, Turns out um, that we did uh, talk about um, in our, in our room. Uh, we did talk about and and find pretty low uh, the substantive conversation and the connection to the real world were our two lowest. Um, I'm only going to say that right now, just in the interest of time, because I know you had authentic discussions already, so we don't need to hear all of them right now. But keep your keep your number and how you felt in it in your head. I'm going to come to that shortly. Um, at, at, you know, at the risk of losing your goodwill, I'm going to wait a few minutes to discuss the details of where Wes fell, uh, but you may have an idea already. Um, I will confirm that he landed in the limited quartile um, at, and bottom one is minimal. So he landed in one up from minimal. Um, and, and as you'll see, so did most of the classes we observed. Um, our first research question did ask, uh, to what extent do teachers in study schools offer authentic pedagogy and how much variation exists between teachers in the experiences. Um, and the scores for instruction and assessment suggest that students in most study classrooms did not experience high levels of authentic pedagogy. Remember, it's hard to do it, but now you can see it. I won't read it to you because I see you can read for yourself. Um, and our findings, sadly, are consistent with the prevalence of authentic pedagogy in earlier studies. Um, but I do wanna emphasize it's hard to do well on this. They're extremely demanding. And I hope you found that in, in even your brief moments of looking at it. Um, if you were to get the high end, you, that would be truly exceptional teaching. Um, so in our judgment, anybody who hit the moderate level is doing really good work, strong and challenging teaching. So that means 21% of our study classrooms had a meaningful experience with authentic pedagogy. And it's, it's noteworthy that the worst scores were in the real world, connection to the real world and to students' lives. They were consistently lower in all the quartiles. Um, and in, um, even in the limited and moderate quartiles, you know, substantive conversation scores were substantially lower than for higher order thinking and deep knowledge. And um, it, you know, it's probably harder to develop rich discussions in connection to rele relevant issues. Our second research question asked if some groups of students were more likely to experience authentic pedagogy than others. And we examined certain demographics and contextual variables. Um, it, you know, including the uh, class and, um, and the school and class size. And we did find that gender was the only demographic variable found to have a st statistically significant relationship to authentic pedagogy. Um, 
we did have for context, a significant correlation with smaller class size, but not class type. Um, and we didn't find anything for ethnicity, as you can see, with anything st uh, significant. Um, our third question asked, what's the relationship between student performance on mandated tests of content knowledge and the AIW scores? And for the entire sample of 52 teachers, we aggregated the test scores for each teacher and then put them with the AIW to see whether they met or exceeded the state mandated standards. And um, I do have to say though, that you know a lack of a common prior achievement measure for the entire sample, six different states, six different tests, um, you know, restricts conclusions about what you can draw, obviously, because they're not all taking the same test. Um, we also examined a subgroup, you can see, of 36 teachers who taught in the regular education class sections, because we were curious about that too. So for the entire teacher sample, the n equals 52, um, we looked at the connections, the pass rates, the scale scores, um, comparing to the state and the school averages. And um, what, uh, uh, although not statistically significant, positive relationships resulted between achievement and teachers' overall level of authentic pedagogy. What was statistically significant was a relationship between higher levels of AIW and the percentage of students exceeding the school cut scores, as you can see. Um, further examination of the relationship between uh, AIW and student achievement revealed statistically significant relationships with two of the four components. Higher achievement was associated with deep knowledge and higher order thinking. Um, in the sample of the regular education classes, that's 36 out of the uh, 52. Although other findings were not statistically significant, students of moderate teachers had a higher overall pass rate, as you can see, than their school peers who experienced lower levels of AIW um, at, at the minimal level and the limited levels, you can see. Um, uh, whereas it's really 9.6% 9 9 higher with a moderate effect size, so uh, at the moderate level. So. The most important contribution of this study uh, in its investigation uh, of this is this broad sample is that there's, you know, there had been no large scale study done. Um, and the findings are kind of bad news, good news. <laughs> the bad news is there's certainly not enough AIW going on. You could see that <laughs> by the graph. Um, it's rare. It's noteworthy that we found no teachers. Uh, in the substantial quartile, even though we deliberately set out to find examples of, of AIW. Uh, the good news is it's, it, our belief that the moderate level is challenging instruction. Uh, more good news, we found no evidence that associating, uh, uh, that would associate higher levels of authentic pedagogy with lower performance on state tests. Um, and so there's no argument for not doing it, even if administrators are applying test prep pressure. Um, there's significantly higher pass rates uh, than the school average at the moderate level. Um, authentic pedagogy does not harm and may enhance performance on high stakes tests. That's important. Um, these results really run counter to common beliefs about uh, among many teachers and administrators that you should focus on lower order coverage of factual knowledge and that will produce successful results. Um, but that's not true. And, and, but also you shouldn't look at this line of research as a warrant for continuing these sort of uh, low level state tests. Um, in fact, we should take little comfort in the feedback that the tests provide about either student learning or teaching proficiency. Um, although students outperform their peers of the moderate AIW teachers, pass rates on the state tests included in the study were high for everybody. Uh, and that's not good when the you know, level is so low and the teaching and the level of work is so low. Uh, so that doesn't make sense. And it doesn't tell us much about the preparation of graduates for the demands of engaged 21st century citizenship either, uh, if the tests may remain powerful inhibitors to the promotion of AIW in classrooms. Those lower level tests kind of remind me of this old Calvin and Hobbes cartoon Sad, sad. Um, so we observed teachers in the lower scoring quartiles whose lessons presented moments of opportunity and possibility that were often not pursued 
And we wanted then to focus on how to empower and encourage the teachers to seize those moments. And across all quartiles, as I said, you know, connecting this to the real world and students' lives really were the lowest. Um, so we were trying to think, what could we do about that? So we did one little follow-up study and we didn't do a new study. We just looked at the data we had and found um, a teacher from each quartile that taught a US foreign policy lesson. Um, three of them were on the Cold War. One was on the US-Mexican War. And we, we looked at what practices characterize what they did in their classrooms for authentic pedagogy, and then what kind of decisions and actions seem the most facilitating or inhibiting of it. Um, and um, the four cases, um, the, that last one on the Mexican War, that was from the substantial one, and that was an elective, and they had no test. Um, so, so we didn't do a lot with that one because again, they're not in the situation that everyone else is in, which is trying to pass a test. Um, and they had a special exemption from the state uh, to do a, a performance assessment, not, um, not a, a pencil and paper test. Uh, so that's least likely to be obtainable. So just the two I wanna focus on um, are Wes, the one you looked at, the limited lesson uh, level, and then the um, moderate level uh, above it. So here's the analysis I held back from your handout on Wes. I just did the, uh, did the listing of what he did, but here's what he got, as you can see. Um, the highest thing he got was higher order thinking. Um, they did some. <laughs> uh, deep knowledge, no. They were repeating almost verbatim what the teacher had said. Substantive conversation, they did chat a lot in the pairs, but there wasn't a lot of follow-up. And connectedness, no. There was no attempt to connect to present day, even though we were fighting two different wars at that time. The, there, there was none. Um, so then we looked at an example from the moderate level. And Lee... Uh, is the moderate teacher and he taught a ninth grade world history course and all of his activities were problem solving, applying knowledge with evidence-based arguments. This one, he was having uh, students kind of empathize with President Truman during the 1948 Berlin crisis. Um, he developed his own materials. They analyzed four possible courses of action and then assumed decision-making roles to recommend a crisis solution. Uh, so he introduced the background of the crisis, explained what it was, and gave them a little document uh, written from Truman's perspective that introduced the factors he might consider. He read the document aloud and emphasized the ideas that what Truman was wrestling with. And then he broke them into four expert groups. And this is a little excerpt from the expert group where they received a fictitious but historically accurate letter from one advisor to Truman. Um, either it was Kennan or it was Marsh or it was Wallace advocating a solution to the crisis. And each letter was prefaced with background information on the advisor and each letter included questions to guide each group's conversation about their advisor's argument. He went from group to group and engaged with the material and checked their sourcing. And here's what one of them was, as you can see. And you can see uh, they're talking, we shouldn't be strong, so strong with the Russians. Yeah, but we both have atomic bombs. But some people might argue that when faced with strength, the Soviets have historically backed off. They joined the non-aggression pact in World War II when faced with Hitler's powerful army. They pulled back in World War I and eventually signed a peace treaty. How do you respond to this point if you're a Wallace? You just have to let them, the Russians, do what they want. They'll just get tougher. That doesn't make sense, et cetera, you can see. And at the end, he ends, dig into this further and, and see how you're gonna respond. So, during the final minutes of the 30 minutes of the class, they went into new decision-making groups composed of representatives of each of the four advisors. And then they began arguments of their, they presented their arguments and began discussing the strengths and weaknesses of each option. They didn't get to finish in that class period uh, with a consensus recommendation. So here's how this one scored. This one obviously has much deeper knowledge and the teacher weighs in with deeper knowledge. But still, but still that last one, again, one student connected to the Iraq war, but otherwise no connection to anything going on in current times. 
So we looked at at the end then, what, gee, what were the teacher purposes that we could pull out? What were the lesson structures and what were the narratives? And, you know, the purposes were quite, quite different in these two quartiles. Um, you know, Wes was about knowing facts and uh, that were assessed by the state test. He hoped his students would do things that, like think critically, but he didn't really leave space to do that. If you recall when you were in your groups, it said it left less than an inch for them to answer things. Whereas Lee described his teaching philosophy as focusing on preparing students to be informed decision makers who saw history as a tool for reasoning about issues affecting their lives. There were really different ways in that the lessons were structured. Um, in the top two quartiles, teachers set and modeled norms for inquiry and discourse that are essential for classroom thoughtfulness. They listened to student discourse. They challenged and supported students to think more, more deeply. And you know, you didn't hear that in Wes's class um, in the limited classroom. The breadth of content narrowed and time for engaging that content expanded in, as the authentic pedagogy grew. Um, so at the minimal level, it's very broad and thin. At the limited level, it's more bounded, but not deep as we, as we noted. And at the upper levels, content is tightly bounded and deep. And finally, the ways they structure classes produce different lesson narratives that communicated different assumptions about the complexity of social reality and the process of making meaning. The narratives of these lessons reveal a progression from sort of a single superficial uncritical story of America to a complex understanding that the decisions US leaders make are worthy of investigation analysis and critique. Well, while Wes's lessons appeared to have more ambitious goals, you know, they didn't, as we've talked about. Um, the bulleted information, the brief time, the little expectation for, for conversation, no elaboration. Versus in the moderate case example that we didn't get to fully examine, but you got to see an excerpt from. Um, those are, there's, there's structures that link knowledge and big ideas and time for developing those ideas and scaffolding for helping students develop those ideas. Uh, there's, there's comfort with the messiness and inefficiency uh, of knowledge construction that was not visible in Wes's tightly scripted lesson. Uh, Lee's commitment to civic competence to prepare informed decision makers uh, capable of autonomy, deep reflection, complex understanding was evident as he did all those things that you can see listed. His materials are, are much deeper and better. Um, and then as he went around, he listened carefully. He challenged and supported kids as they worked through the arguments. He kept responsibility for their problem resolution in their hands, not in his hands. And they're really kind of contingent narratives, a contingent view of history that it's not settled. And, and as you can see, um, so it's a real different kind of epistemology in Lee's class than in Wes's class. The decisions made by leaders are worthy of investigation and worthy of discussion. Oops. Uh, so given the centrality of teacher purpose to classroom interactions, it, it, it does seem unrealistic that somebody's gonna move from limited, from minimal <laughs> up really far. But, but it's not unrealistic to think that Wes, you know, who does value civic competency and is in the limited area, could move up um, and, and maybe empower his students to reach a, a higher goal with professional development. Uh, the majority of our sample did score in that limited range. And, and it does seem to call for more challenging work. Uh, however, uh, you know, we're really missing <laughs> um, uh, these kind of elements required for successfully enacting it, uh, enacting AIW. Um, assisting teachers to identify and seize these missed opportunities, particularly for promoting sustained substantive conversations and making explicit connections to things that students value might really yield noteworthy results. Uh, and, and really head for what Newman calls classroom thoughtfulness. Um, so teachers at higher levels of the AIW scale sought to promote autonomy and civic competence and to maintain democratic societies, educators must expand the number of classrooms offering students this essential preparation for civic life. After all, as David Matthews of the Kettering Foundation points out, in a democracy, we're all public officials. So returning to my junior high and high school experiences, 
<laughs> Yikes. <laughs> I, I was fortunate to have electives and teachers whose classes provided a great deal of authentic intellectual work. But the question of AIW remains an apt one at the college level. Are we doing authentic intellectual work in our classes? How are we doing on these different levels of higher order thinking, deep knowledge, substantive conversations, those hard ones, and connectedness to real world? Do lectures produce AIW? A mix of lecture and discussion? How many students are engaging in discussion when we have them? How would our discussion classes score on the AIW rubrics? Does class size make a difference in answering these questions? Do university professors get enough professional development to address these questions? Huh, I better end there. <laughs> so for more information, these are the two articles. And now in the brief time we have remaining, I am happy to answer questions. Thanks. Thank you very much, um, Andrea, uh, for a thoughtful uh, presentation, but also making us reflect ourselves on the, the pedagogy uh, practices and how we can improve so that we actually have authentic intellectual work in, uh, uh, in our classroom. I have to say, unfortunately, uh, you know, we have only up to 2.15 and we're at, we have two minutes. Um, <laughs> Uh, before we can say thank you. So one of the things we're gonna have to uh, do is kind of limit if there's, we can perhaps take one, uh, one, one, one question. Um, Maggie, we have one in the chat from Sabrina. Uh, doesn't authentic pedagogy unfold over a number of class sessions? Great question, Sabrina, of course. Um, but what we did is we chatted with the um, uh, teacher when we did the interviews and figured out the class to see that that teacher identified as the one that would have the most intellectual work in it. So uh, you're absolutely right. Observing a longer time frame would make uh, the study better um, and would give more information. But in the limited time that one has, um, asking the teacher to identify the best place to observe uh, made a lot of sense, um, but, but you're, you're completely correct. Thank you. Any other question? Andrea, um, some of the participants are asking if you can show the last okay. slide yeah. again. Sure. Oh, nope, that's not the one. Hold on, <laughs> let me go down and find the one that is. Here it is, there it is. And you know, credit to, as you can see, John Say was the lead author um, out of Auburn. Um, he's now retired, uh, who spearheaded the whole project. I think we have one more question, right? Sure. Uh, Allison? Yes, let me just yeah. open the chat mm -hmm. um, from, just Santangelo, what if any differences were there in Wes and Lee's backgrounds and professional development experiences? So we did we did check on those two. Um, and um, they actually, you know, both of them were identified as um, whatever in their state was uh, a, an, a, a, a state, I guess Wes was a nationally board certified teacher. Um, and then Lee was identified as something in his state that had been an excellent teacher. Um, so they were identified as, as very good teachers in some kind of way, but again, not the same measurement, state and national, who knows. Um, and um, both of them had, um, they fell into the uh, age, that upper age group um, in the upper 40s, um, in their mid 40s actually. Uh, and um, both of them had taught about the same time, interestingly. Um, so that that actually didn't seem uh, to, when we were looking at teachers factors, it wasn't um, how long people had taught didn't tell us very much as it turns out. Remember there's only 52 teachers also, I wanna say. So it's not an enormous sample, um, but, um, but that didn't yield very much information. Um, what yielded more information, uh, it, it turns out, uh, the, the thing that was clearest was people who didn't teach in high stakes testing were the only ones to achieve a substantial level of pedagogy, uh, which is sort of a depressing situation. On the other hand, maybe we should all be working for getting rid of high stakes testing. 
Uh, Maggie, you. I think we have you, uh, just a final question. Yes. Final question from Linda Damata. How are you training teachers to be to engage in these practices? Great question. Um, so I, I think um, my colleagues and I in the School of Ed, uh, at both the elementary level and the secondary level, try and do lots of authentic intellectual work. But, uh, but I think the other thing we do that's important is there's a lot of research that indicates that even if you go to a school of ed that where you do a lot of that kind of work, you get out into schools and you're less likely to do it because you kind of conform to what's happening. Um, some of my colleagues have done a lot of work on that. Uh, but um, one of the things we do at the secondary and elementary levels is we have organizations that pull students back, um, alumni back, to meet periodically. Uh, my colleague Alan Singer started that with a new teacher network at the secondary level, and I do it with the HNET group, so that they're not high and dry adrift when they go to schools, because it's hard not to do what everyone else is doing. Um, so you kind of have to make them strong uh, to be able to do it. But I think the one other thing we certainly do in my elementary methods class is we look at what the tests look like and see that at least at the elementary level, it was just a skills test. So you could do anything, any kind of authentic intellectual work and your students would do fine on it. Um, and when you make students aware of this research, that the test ought not to drive instruction, that ought to be freeing for anyone. Thank you so much, um, um, Andrea. The, uh, one thing, I, it, it was asked whether you would uh, share the PowerPoint. Uh, sure, uh, with, uh, so we, and how do I do that? You know what, Andrea, if you'd like to send it to me, I can okay. actually send it to everybody who RSVP'd and if they're sure. interested, that would be great. No and problem. They, yeah. Okay. So uh, this was uh, really wonderful, wonderful questions that are posed, and I'm sure there are many more, and some of you will reach out directly to, to Andrea, and that the conversation doesn't end here, but continues. So can we all just give Andrea uh, a round of applause? We can unmute and perhaps <laughs> signal. So thank you very much.